how much better would it be to equip them with a confidence that's going to serve them well into their adulthood in order to be able to communicate when we so desperately need communicators. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, do you remember what I said to you right when we were getting ready to record this podcast? You said, this is going to be my favorite podcast ever. Yes. And I said, that's a high bar. And then you walked into a room full of? All my friends. Yeah. So here we are with, well, not all of your friends, because I don't think a room could hold all of your friends. But we have with us today four guests in the studio, all who work for IEW. And these listeners are our exemplar candidates? Well, I don't know. What, we, what do we call you guys? The people who told people how to do public speaking well. So we're talking today about our introduction to public speaking course. Right. And one of the things that we love to do at IEW is we love to not tell them what to do. We want to show them. And so after every example, after every exercise, we have what we call exemplars. So we have with us today, Nathan, who did the exemplar for Casey at the Bat. Got a little story about that. We have Will, who's here today. He did the exemplar for a self-introductory speech. We also have with us Michelle, who did the narrative speech. And then we don't have with us today, Rachel, who did the expository speech, but I can tell you a little bit about that, or Claire, who did the persuasive speech. Mm. But then ending, we have Maria, who demonstrated how to do an impromptu speech. So six different opportunities that we had for exemplars. It was a lot of fun. I, I don't generally watch myself on video, but the little clips I have seen, I thought, wow, that's pretty good. Those yep. guys make me look great. <laughs> it's true. And I will just say, because I do watch this video over and over and over again. It's part of quality control, if that's what you call it. But I learned so much, and I've done talks before at conventions and led Bible studies and such. But since us releasing this course, I myself have learned a lot of different things that I've already started using in my public speaking. So I'm happy to say that I check, have used this course. I love it and would say everybody needs to go out and buy this if you want to teach your kids or yourself public speaking. <gasps> Here's a story I have to tell you. So listeners, I just got back from Hawaii. It's true. My husband and I went on a vacation, but one of our friends that we met while we were in Hawaii was Monica Swanson. Oh, yes. She's been on our podcast. Yes. Yeah. And her son... Actually, two of her sons are going to be doing the Introduction to Public Speaking course together so that she can improve her public speaking. And her son is actually going to be doing a little talk at one of her conferences that she's giving. So Awesome. Yeah, we're really happy about that. So, Andrew, when you had the students memorize poetry, one of the poems that you had them memorize was Casey at the Bat. Do you want to just give a little bit of background about why we chose that poem for this course? Well, it's a, it's a story poem. It's got a beautiful meter and rhyme scheme. It's a classic. Like everyone should know that poem mm -hmm. just to be culturally literate. And it has boy appeal because of the baseball element and it has the kind of surprise twist at the end. So I just think it's a model of a very engaging piece of poetry. And so that's kind of why I thought it would be a good one to use. Plus, it's in the public domain, and that makes a, a huge <laughs> difference for accessibility for everyone. Now, what was your assignment that you gave the students? Do you recall? I think just one stanza each. And they had to memorize, memorize it, it and speak with expression. 
the students did not do that very well. Well, I, it was <laughs> the first thing. And, you know, a lot of them are in that age of being a little bit awkward and standing up in front of your peers and other people. And cameras in particular can cause people maybe to be less expressive than they would if they were relating a story or telling a poem to, you know, their friends or cousins or something. So, you know, the pressure is there, but then that's what the whole course is about, right. is learning how to be your best, even under a little bit of pressure. Right, exactly. And, you know, ever the optimist, I was hoping that we could use the students as an exemplar in this case. And we decided to bring in someone to do a true exemplar, and that's Nathan. So Nathan, welcome to our podcast. Thank you. So tell us about your experience in reciting Casey at the Bat. Well, Julie had given me the, the assignment to to put that together, and I don't remember what the, the timeline was, but I thought, okay, I've got to break this down. I've got to do just what you you talked about, Andrew, as far as you know, just do it bit by bit here. And I have a, a just not a, a terribly long commute to to work every day, but I use that commute very well. I would rehearse it, you know, and I would go over it over and over again. And I got very excited about sharing this, and I did. I, I did want to do it in a very animated way. And in fact, one time we actually had a staff meeting together. This, I think this may have been after we recorded it. It may have been before. I can't remember. But I was excited to, to kind of share that with the rest of our staff. And so one, one person gave me a baseball cap that I put on backwards. And I and I had, you know, someone gave me some gum so I could have some gum so I could I could do the, you know, kind of the Babe Ruth kind of look or whatever. And, and I was getting ready to do this thing. And I started and we were right beside a church. And apparently there was a wedding going on at the same time. And they asked us maybe to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I do believe my superpower, if God has given me a superpower, is loudness of voice. Therefore, I stopped. So, anyway. <laughs> but but I but I did notice just Andrew, what you we talked about as far as like an engaging poem. I actually gave this poem. I did a recitation for some of my my nephews and or one of my nephews and nieces, and they'd never heard it before. I mean, you know, cultural literacy. I mean, a lot of the younger students have not heard this, one, and they were completely riveted. And it reminded me just like what you said, you had some um, memorized repertoire you had in Japan of the um, Jack and the Beanstalk. And that was, you know, you, you talked about how the students were just riveted. And my, my niece and nephew were just, I guess, awestruck at that, that I knew this poem. <laughs> well, don't lose it. Say it often enough that you can recite it for your great grandchildren 40 years from now. Oh, nice. I like that. I do recite it on the way home sometimes. <laughs> the other thing, I don't know if this is connected at all, but... So say the first line. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two, but one inning more to play. Right. So you use that word brilliant a lot. And I don't know if it made its way to a more dominant place in your vocabulary because of having started the poem and having recited that line so many times. But it is interesting how when kids memorize poems and they have words that are maybe a little off the ordinary – those words then move from kind of the passive vocabulary into the active vocabulary. And you know, that's a big plus for memorizing poetry. And one good reason we start with poems. Yep. So I have another little behind the scenes secret to share. And that is when we invited Will to do our self-introductory speech. So we said, hey, Will, tell us a little bit about yourself. And he wrote this speech and it was so good. But one of the things he mentioned in the speech was to do something that we found out later was actually illegal. And so we said, yeah, we're going to have to redo that one. So you'll notice if you have the Introduction to Public Speaking course, both Nathan's exemplar and Will's exemplar are against a black background because we had to do it without the students being present because we did this much later. So, Will, you want to give a little bit about your story about your self-introductory speech and what was illegal that oh, yeah. you were asking these kids to do? We are all dying to know <laughs> what is the illegal thing <laughs> that you did. Well, when I was in Hawaii uh, about five, six years ago, it was spring break uh, during one of my years of college with my dad. And we discovered there's this big staircase over the top of the mountains uh, in, uh, well, near Honolulu. And Apparently, the stairs used to be open for anyone, but they've kind of gotten run down over the decades and unsafe, and so they've been locked down. 
But thrill seekers will still sneak in. There's not much, you know, just a little fence or something to get past. And so there's many stories online of people that have sneaked in and gotten up there. And unfortunately, what happens is a lot of people make it halfway up and then they lose their nerve or they get too tired and then they end up having to be rescued by helicopter. And that's very expensive (laughs) for the city. So that I think is the big reason that they're now thinking about just removing the stairs altogether, unfortunately. So you do mention it as almost in passing with the exemplar that it would be nice to be able to do that. Yes. And there was there was talk for, you know, really the last 20 years about maybe rebuilding the stairs much more safely so that people could do that. And so that's kind of what I had in mind during this speech. But now it sounds like they're just going to remove the stairs. So, so Nathan had an easier task in the sense that His content was already written. You, of course, had to write your own content because when you're doing a self-introductory speech, you have to come up with your own content. Can you describe a little bit about that process? Yeah, I think one thing that I really observed during the process of writing it was that we all have those kind of interesting experiences to share. We might think we live a completely ordinary life, but I think every one of us has a completely unique story. So for me, after a little bit of thought, I realized, you know, hey, I have three, four, five really cool things I've done in my life that other people would love to hear about. And I think if any of us would sit down and do a little bit of that thinking, we'd, you know, maybe it's a famous person we met or a cool place we've been to. But, you know, it's really a journey of self-discovery. And and what you realize is that your story is worth sharing. And so it is a really cool experience for me. Very good. I would say that one thing that makes that interesting and engaging is a level of detail. You know, people are telling you what happened to them. The more they can paint the picture, the more you can feel like you're you're there with them or you, you're seeing it happen, then the more interesting and engaging it is. And so I think Will did a great job in adding enough detail that his old boring life, <laughs> you know, looked a lot more interesting. Yes. Then then maybe it would have if it had been more of kind of a grocery list of things. So that's one of the things we're trying to promote in kids writing, you know, writing in general speeches, but that when you're talking about yourself in particular, what will draw the person into the shared experience you had? And usually it's that detail. Yeah. And Will, in your few years on this earth, I mean, you're, you're a third of the age of Andrew and me. <laughs> You've definitely packed a lot of interesting content into your speech, even ending with your aspirations to become a pilot, of which you are now. I just want to point out that Julie's math is pretty bad. And so her third is not a very accurate estimate. <laughs> I know Will's age. <laughs> and it's more like Two and a half. Two and a half, okay, Rather well, than three times. But I guess if you're rounding I up. was going to say, my math isn't bad. I just know how to round. <laughs> I'm in marketing. I exaggerate, I suppose. Well, the third type of speech that was given that you instructed the students how to do was the narrative. And, of course, being the Institute for Excellence in Writing, we have a model for how to write a narrative using the story sequence chart. And so we just applied that to doing a narrative speech. And of course, our exemplar was Michelle. So Michelle, welcome to our podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Your story, I had never heard your story before, and it was so good. So please tell our listeners a little bit about your story. Well, it's not one that I like to share very often, but now it's forever recorded. So I'm working (laughs) on my humility. But I tell these students who are in high school kind of my adventure into the big wide world after I graduated thinking I was ready to be all Miss Independent. And it relays the story of how I'm in Europe and newly into a school year find myself being carted away from the campus in an ambulance by German speaking ambulance people to the (laughs) hospital and how embarrassing that was and how it taught me a lesson, right? Because stories are there to teach of asking for help when you need it and being independent isn't all it cracked up to be. So yeah, it was, it was a good time and it was humbling. 
<laughs> and we did not have to redo yours at all. No, fortunately, I don't know how I got so lucky. And I had never heard that story until that moment. Right. That she stood up in front of the whole class and the cameras and I was just captivated. It was it was so engaging. Yes, yes. And of course, Michelle, you do have a background in speech and debate. So you want to share a little bit about that? Yes, I competed in the homeschool speech and debate league during high school. So I did a lot of debate. I did, yes, memorize speeches, kind of like the one I did better at some than others. But yes, that was definitely the most informative an impactful experience of my high school. And it really has done so much for confidence and just being able to hold yourself well in public. And I think largely the reason I was able to tell an embarrassing story in front of cameras was because of that competition in high school. I think it's worth mentioning also that Michelle ended up marrying her debate partner, which was kind of against all odds from my perspective. <laughs> But uh, but the years passed and the relationship blossomed and uh, it was a delightful thing. So join speech and debate. You never know who <laughs> you might meet. But that, uh, you know, I do a lot of long talks and none of these speeches were very long. But when you go and talk for an hour, you really do have to incorporate all these aspects. You have to give a little bit of information about yourself and your life because people want to know. You have to realize when the audience is starting to maybe drift their attention a bit and get a story in there so that now they're engaged in a narrative and that story has to apply to the overall message that you are trying to do. So, you know, these speeches are short and specific but they're all there for the reason that they are components of effective presentations that may be, you know, significantly longer. You mentioned two things, Andrew, just now that I think you made very clear in this Introduction to Public Speaking course, and that is you need to know two things before you start speaking, and that is how long should this speech be and Nathan, you had a memorized poem. Will, how long was your speech supposed to be? Uh, about three to five minutes. And Michelle, how long was yours? I think it was about three to five minutes. Yep. So these were very short speeches. And I think it's interesting, Andrew, that you say when you notice the audience is starting to... So you need to pay attention to what's happening in the audience. You need to be comfortable enough with public speaking that you can get outside yourself and look at the people in the eye of who you're speaking and finding out whether or not they're starting to nod off so you need to switch to a story. Well, and we've all sat through talks where some academic is just reading a paper and yes. he's like, why am I even sitting here? Just right. give me the thing and I'll read it. Or someone who's so caught up in their own content that they're oblivious to the fact that you wish you could leave now, but you can't because that would be rude. Yes. So there is that you know skill of being sensitive to the audience. And there's no substitute for that in terms of training. You've just got to get out in front of people. As a musician, I remember reading about the famous Russian pianist Vladimir Horowitz. And he once said that during a recital, if he didn't hear anyone coughing, he knew they were really connected with the music. And if they did start coughing, he would always speed up a little bit to get them back into <laughs> ah, what he was playing. I like that. I like that. Now, the next speech that we did that you taught was the expository speech. Now, we don't have Rachel here, but I, I will tell you a little bit about her presentation. But first, I want you to explain, Andrew, to this audience, what is an expository speech? Well, the Latin is ex and posit, which means to place. So you're, you're putting something in front of people. And it usually is considered to be a teaching mm -hmm. kind of speech. You're, you're sharing information generally with a friendly audience. There's no need to persuade or necessarily motivate specifically. And you're just teaching, sharing, speaking about something that you know that you hope would be of interest for other people to know. So that's generally what you would think of in expository. Right. And so Rachel did an expository speech on a capsule wardrobe. Oh, yes. 
Do you I remember, remember that? that? Yeah. And I loved I loved this idea. She's a college student, or she was a college student. She's now graduated and married and off to law school. So, And she also did some competitive forensics in college. Mm. And more about that in just a second. But her, her talk about a capsule wardrobe was basically invest in high-quality clothing but fewer pieces that you can then reuse at you know various times. So a good coat, a good comfortable pair of shoes. Anyway, it was it was fascinating, and I I just love that I walked away with not only learning some of the practicality of coming up with the topics, coming up with the, the attention getter, and then walking away with a call to action. You know how many of us have a closet just bulging full of clothes. You no, know, as I recall hearing it, and I think I was. Somehow getting a little Marie Kondo, you know, the surprising joy (laughs) of being organized or something. And I went home and I just got rid of a bunch of clothes I never wear. And uh, I continue. In fact, as a result of that, I have this strict rule. If I gain a piece of clothing, I get rid of a piece of clothing. Mm -hmm. I have not yet managed to convince my wife of the the (laughs) benefits of this. But yeah, so yeah, it was a good talk. Yeah, it was very good. And then following the expository speech, you talked about persuasive speaking. And basically, there were two goals of persuasive speaking. One was to move someone further along to what they've already believed so that they could now do something about it. And the other side that's probably even harder is to take someone from a position and change their mind to something different. So I don't know if you remember this speech, Andrew, but Claire, I believe, did a really nice job of converting most of the audience to believe that stress is actually a good thing. Because so often we're told stress is bad, stress causes bad health, and you know, but the outcome in her research was that stress actually resulted in a positive, mm. positive outcome. Well, you think about people in the world who have greater impact, Mm -hmm. usually they have more stress in their life. So (laughs) if you're afraid of stress, it's almost like you're going to be afraid of making a difference and doing hard things. Right. So, yes. And so Claire, she, of course, exemplified a memorized speech, but we don't require students to memorize their speeches, but they're writing them. And Andrew, talk about the process from coming up with the idea and writing a speech and then turning it into a speech? Well, we are encouraging people more or less to make an outline from their idea, what they want to accomplish, narrative, expository, persuasive, and then write it and then make an outline from their written out speech to assist them with delivering the speech either with minimal notes or eventually memorizing it, depending how much time and effort they have to put into that. So it is kind of, well, why do that? Why why not just write, you know, talk from the outline? But as anyone knows, when you really work on how you're going to say something, you just improve the overall quality of language, the preciseness, the use of words. You avoid repetitive vocabulary. You avoid cliches that may detract from the effectiveness. So when you write, you're really polishing the thought itself. Then you make an outline from your more polished thought, and then you can deliver a superior product. So it is a longer process, but the result is it's so significantly better. Yes, exactly. And I would mention in competition, you have to submit the script of your speech. Right. (laughs) So they're expecting that you've written the whole thing out. You can't just submit an outline and say, here, I'm going to talk from notes. That's not part of the way the speech and debate world operates. So there's the sixth speech that we did that was required. Actually, you weren't allowed to prepare, and that was the impromptu speech. And so you had a little bit of time to prepare, but we had Maria. And there's so many things I could say about Maria. Maria we affectionately call her our podcast princess. Andrew, you and I sound 
better than we actually are because she edits our podcast and writes up the show notes for us. And so listeners, if you're ever clicking on one of the links in our show notes, you know you can thank Maria for that. But Maria also has a little background in competitive speech and debate and even on into college. So Maria, talk about your background, and then talk about the type of speech that you gave for our Introduction to Public Speaking course. Absolutely. I, too, did speech and debate. I actually did speech and debate with Michelle, and Michelle is actually married to my brother. So just a little bit of background there. Speech and debate was extremely formative, I would say, in this, just in the sense of exposure. If you want to get better at public speaking, you have to expose yourself regularly to the activity. And I definitely attribute most of my ability to just, you know, communicate both orally and in written language to having done speech and debate throughout high school. And now in undergraduate at the University of Oklahoma, and I'm actually the president of the mock trial team there. So I do a lot of public speaking regularly, both impromptu and prepared. It's a mix of both. So for my impromptu speech, I came into the studio and like a typical impromptu speech, at least in the league that I competed in, you pull from three topics and you have two minutes to prepare a speech on one of those topics. So the topic that I chose was a quote by Kipling, and it is that words are, of course, the most powerful drug used by mankind. And this one immediately appealed to me. I am pursuing my Bachelor of Arts in the humanities specifically, and so I definitely believe in the power of the word, especially to change people's hearts, to change people's minds, to change really the course of history. So yeah, it was very scary. I will say that the nerves don't ever really go away. I had two minutes to prepare, I think about like a three minute speech. So it was fun though. It was fun. It's, it was exhilarating, I'd say. Yes. I remember when we were asking if you would be one of our exemplars because you were away at school and we had to, you know, coax you to come back up here. We said, well, what speech do you want to give? And she said, impromptu. That's your favorite. <laughs> it is fun. And it requires the least amount of preparation. So. <laughs> and I, I remember listening to it thinking, I couldn't do that well. That, that was better than I could have done. You had more practice in a way, yeah. Yeah. So you can see all of these exemplars and more in our introduction to public speech. Well, when I say more, you know, of course, Rachel and Claire are not here today, but they all did an excellent job. And you'll see some of our students do a mildly decent, pretty good job for being in front of cameras. And some of them were brand new to public speaking, very nervous. When all the exemplar people are a bit or a lot older right. <laughs> than the students. so And that's fine because you want something to be able to look at as a model and say, I want to strive to be that good. Exactly. At least. Exactly. Well, I'd love to go around the room and starting with Nathan and ending with Maria and then you, Andrew, why is learning public speaking so valuable? So there's a quote uh, recently, I think, in a, in a podcast that we heard from Jordan Peterson talking about how lethal we are as writers, right, and the written word. But of course, the reality is that in the modern day, so much of how we communicate is through the spoken word. And so while the formation of thoughts and the honing of our thinking is, you know, writing is so essential there, the actual delivery of that is the spoken word. And it really doesn't matter if it's in video or if it's, if it's live. I mean, this is what's going to make a huge difference in the culture. I think when we hear about language arts, we immediately think of workbooks, grammar, you know, writing, obviously, reading. But I think speaking and listening are just as important, if not more. And it's like language arts, but more direct. And it brings a little bit of excitement to students because you get that little bit of nervousness in a way that you don't when you're writing or reading. And so I think public speaking is hugely formative for communication? I would say fear is temporary, confidence lasts. So often students will either hate the idea or be kind of drawn to the idea of public speaking. So how much better would it be to equip them with a confidence that's going to serve them well into their adulthood in order to be able to communicate when we so desperately need communicators? So it's worth the hard work. It's worth getting over the fear in order to nurture someone who can contribute. I think that when you're in your high school years, or even younger than that, I mean, I started speech and debate when I was 12. It's a really sensitive time for you where you're easily able to be molded. And so I think that taking a public speaking course 
when you're in your high school years is going to be so much more formative than when you start later on, which is why I think that students really should start right now. It's kind of like what I said earlier, the more you expose yourself, the more confident you are going to be. And being able to not just speak publicly, but just to speak with your colleagues, to speak with your peers, to speak with your professors, whatever profession you have to go into, being able to communicate effectively is extremely important. And so I think that students should take it because it's going to serve them well in the long run. Wow, Andrew, can you top that? No, I don't even <laughs> want to try. That, that's excellent. Uh, especially I like that idea that fear is temporary and mm-hmm. confidence is lasting. Mm-hmm. But I'm just going to hit on a super practical point. I have been to more weddings in mm. the last couple years than I would have wanted to, <laughs> honestly. I mean, I'm always glad I went. But one of the things you have to suffer through are these speeches mm-hmm. at weddings. And... I find this somewhat interesting just because of my background in public speaking. And I remember one wedding in particular, the maid of honor, she she was so organized. She had it down. She had practiced it. She knew exactly what she was going to say. It was a delight to listen to. And the poor best man just floundered around with, (laughs) you know, and cuz and a thousand likes and dude – why? <laughs> Why was this poor man so embarrassing? Because he hadn't had the training. He hadn't had the opportunity. We can't fault him for his own incompetence and ignorance. It was a lack of education. So if for nothing else, you may be called upon to give a speech at a wedding someday and you don't want to embarrass yourself and your side of the table. That's my practical point. (laughs) Well, dear listener, I hope you have enjoyed this podcast as much as Andrew and I did. I think when I was first trying to imagine us doing this, our room was very small (laughs) and how to get this many people in this room. But yet I think the energy that we've had here today and the message that you all gave was so powerful. So I'm really grateful for all of you and for you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Here you can also find show notes and relevant links from today's broadcast. One last thing. Would you mind going to iTunes to rate and review our podcast? This really helps other smart, caring listeners like you find us. Thanks so much.